Now, in 2013, as I explained before, the pastor that I had been under was exposed as not knowing Jesus. I had mentioned that when I didn't believe this, the first day when I had gone on the Sunday, the next day at the men's prayer group, Jesus used the pillar of that particular group to rebuke me in prophecy, to believe and that he was sending me and so on. Now, after this had transpired at my old assembly with the whole prophecy thing and everything, I started fellowshipping a lot more with the men's prayer group and with the people I was fellowshipping with online. Sadly, things did not actually start getting better at the men's prayer group, even though they were praying about situations and praying about the church being cleaned up, there's still something very off or wrong. Things began to get very weird when prophecies that were coming through seemed to be false or weird. For example, the main pillar that I mentioned, he had prayed and started waiting, and then while we were all waiting and praying and so on, a certain brother got up and left the prayer group. I guess he had to go to work or something. I don't know. He had some other engagement. I noticed him leave, and a brother who was sitting beside me noticed this certain brother leave. The main one who was praying and waiting did not. After about five, maybe ten more minutes, it was, it was a little while we were just praying and waiting, the main pillar of the group began to give a prophecy saying that that certain brother who had left that he didn't see leave he was supposed to give a prophecy. Now, keep in mind, in this prayer group, the gifts of prophecy were definitely active. God has definitely used them. Everything was done in order. I, I experienced it myself. The time I doubted that this was the truth and, and this was actually happening, Jesus did correct me supernaturally. It was true that there was true prophecies coming through. And it was done in order. There's times someone would prophesy and then Jesus would tell the next person who's would tell that person who the next person was who's going to prophesy and we would all know and hear and understand it was it was an amazing experience however things were getting weird because this brother just said that this brother was going to prophesy that brother already left and we just sat there and waited I, no one said anything we just waited jesus had me keep really quiet a lot of times and i, I would just watch and i'd bring things up later on after really praying about it so i just remained silent we all remained silent the brother and myself, and then finally this main pillar brother looks up, sees that the certain brother left. He was really frustrated. He's like, oh, man, he left. We all just sat there waiting, and then the main pillar starts prophesying again, and this time the prophecy was correction to be where you're supposed to be, as if the fault was this other certain brother who left, and we don't even know why he had to leave. Now, I found this to be strange because the way I see it is the Holy Spirit should have not given him a prophecy if that brother was there, or at least tell him, listen, this brother was supposed to prophesy and he's not here. That's what the first prophecy should have been. But that's not what he received. He received that this guy was going to prophesy, and the guy was gone. And then when he saw that this brother was gone, then he got the prophecy, oh, you're supposed to be where you're supposed to be. This was just the first one. There were prophecies being given out about another brother saying that he shouldn't be seeking a particular wife that he was seeking to pursue. And they were prophesying and saying that he was supposed to be doing some other church work. This brother married this woman. I heard his testimony. He explained how Jesus led them and how Jesus was speaking to them and how they were even doing some kind of little ministry and stuff together. They're married and they have children right now. The prophecies I heard in that prayer group were false. That, that, that was not that guy's path. I've also heard prophecies in that prayer group. This one would have been the same pillar I mentioned earlier of how God wanted to open up a school in the church and that we were all supposed to go back and research and find out information and bring it all together. I went back and asked Jesus if that was him. Jesus said no. I asked others as the weeks went on if they received anything, if, if Jesus had been giving them anything to research and they didn't receive anything. It was actually kind of confusing. And nothing ever came of that. Sadly, with the same brother, the pillar, he received a prophecy, and he was prophesying, saying that uh, 
There's one who doesn't have a shepherd over them, and they're like a sheep without a shepherd and lost and so on. Jesus convicted me and said, listen, this prophecy, they're prophesying this against you. And later it came up in discussion, which was cool. Like, I, I was happy that, that it did. And I explained my position. I explained to them, listen, well, it's true. I, I don't actually have a human shepherd over me. I, I don't really have a pastor over me anymore. I, I'm not attending that other church. But this is what happened. Because no one knew what happened. I did not go through the story. I wasn't putting it out there. And I wasn't just talking about it with everyone. So I explained to them how everything went down. And I even explained how, at first I doubted, and this same brother who's prophesying against me, God used him to rebuke me and correct me to make sure I went there to deal with things. And then God exposed that this pastor doesn't know him. He's in sin. And I then asked, is, is this who I'm supposed to submit myself over to as a pastor over me when, when the scriptures say he doesn't know who Jesus is? They were confounded, and this with this time, at this time when this discussion was happening, there wasn't a large group of people. It was maybe about three or four people, the main pillars of that prayer group, and myself. It was a great discussion. I, I was more than happy to have it. But the situation was, after I explained this, they didn't have anything else to say. They just they just left it alone. So I also found that kind of strange. And again, Jesus had already told me while the prophecy was going on, that which would have been the week before, that they were prophesying this against me, and it wasn't actually Jesus. Now this one, this one was the worst one. This is the one with the huge red flag. There was a evening that a prophecy was given indicating that if anyone hears anything from Jesus concerning themselves, that they should bring it before the prayer meeting, the men's prayer meeting, so the prophets may bear witness to if it was Jesus speaking or not. And then the statement was made, my word is established by two or three witnesses. And this was supposed to be God speaking. Now, I felt some convictions about this. I was like, "Eh, there's something about this that doesn't sound right. So after we got up from the prophecy and whatnot, I went home. And I asked Jesus about this, and I, I prayed, asking him, okay, is this, is this true? Like, is, is, is that prophecy right? And Jesus said to me, no. He then gave me a teaching that I vaguely knew in the scriptures, that it was not something that I was really sound in. I knew the scriptures said that God's word was forever settled in heaven, but I didn't really know much else after that. And Jesus reminded me of that. He said that his word is forever established and settled in heaven. And... What he said afterwards, I did not know. He said to me that where the scripture says uh, a word is established by two or three witnesses, that's regarding man's word and an accusation brought against someone. That is established by two or three witnesses. He led me to get up and actually go search the scriptures, and I did, and I found that that was true. Nowhere does it say that God's word is established by two or three witnesses, especially human beings. God's word isn't established by human beings. So I went back to the prayer group and the, the following week, and I mentioned that I prayed about this and that I received something, and, you know, we should talk about it. People didn't really seem too interested to do so. They were very busy. I asked if others prayed about it, because I believe I brought it up saying I wanted to pray about it or whatnot, and... In fact, yeah, this happened on the Monday. I prayed about it, and by the Wednesday is when I brought it up again, and they had not prayed about it. It just fell through the the cracks, and nothing really happened with it after that. It wasn't very shortly after this that Jesus finally pulled me out of the Monday-Wednesday prayer meetings, and I was only going to the Thursday. By the end of the summer, what had happened was this minister uh, who was heading these prayer groups, like he was technically the the pastor over these these, uh, prayer meetings, he began his own church. And what ended up happening was he took members out of the members from the church that had the prayer meeting on Monday and Wednesday, and he took some members out of the Thursday with their families and some other uh, people as well. Uh, They started a Friday meeting, and then they they opened up a church um, where they had meetings on Sunday. So churches ended up dividing up because of these men's prayer groups. And basically this minister became the shepherd over 
this prayer group. Now, he operated a little bit more like an apostle. He was actually going from place to place. He'd go to Africa once in a while, and, and he would actually just establish churches. He even had a conversation with me about starting a prayer meeting in a city over. And Jesus told he didn't Jesus didn't leave me to do that, so I, I did not end up doing that. I, I didn't do it. Now, I actually respected this pastor, and I still do, because he's the only one I know of uh, that's preached on 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse like 8 and 9 and stuff like that. Very strict on holiness, but uh, there was an issue when it came to the church system. Now, with all that being said, I'm actually going to bring up something else regarding this minister and regarding my street evangelism, because this is going to be relevant for the future. In this same season... Uh, the minister, this minister spoke to me about my street evangelism and he wanted me to bring people to him. That was ultimately what he was, he was basically saying. In fact, he said it, just bring them to me. He had an issue with the fact that I did not have a shepherd over me. And he had an issue with the fact that I was out there evangelizing and not leading people somewhere. And I explained to him, I was leading them directly to Jesus. And we had a dialogue. It was very, very, very civil. It was great. I was happy to have the discussion, and I was happy he came to me about it. So I just explained my position. And I also demonstrated how I evangelized right in front of him. I, I showed him. I, I took him, and I saw someone in the restaurant where we were, and Jesus led me over to them. And I went, sat down, and I explained, talked to them as I usually do, explained everything. And this girl, she had her own church, and she had her own faith. So I just really just directed her directly to Jesus. So when I returned to this minister and showed him, I said, see, like I, I just spoke with that girl. That's, that's basically what I, what I do. And she already has her own church. I can't just tell her to leave your church and come to this church. That's not what Jesus taught me to do. He literally did not have a response for me. There wasn't anything for him to say. He didn't, he didn't say anything else to me. And that was pretty much the last time I heard about that for that season. So once those churches had divided up and formed a new church, even a Thursday night prayer meeting ended up getting, I guess you could kind of say in a way canceled, the pillar there, he was getting convicted to go to the Friday night meetings, which then eventually became the Sunday church. So myself, my closest brother and another brother, we prayed and asked Jesus if we were supposed to stop praying on Thursday nights. We heard no to keep praying. So we ended up continuing to pray at my closest brother's house. And Jesus started moving and doing amazing things there. That basically concludes my intimate fellowship with that men's prayer group slash the church they formed. I had visited the church once when I had first started, and it was just like the usual churches that you see, same setup and everything except in a gym. At that time, a lot of people really just did not agree with me, and I started getting ostracized a bit. And I still try to stay in contact and I still try to even go to the prayer meetings. But eventually, even that, I was technically told I wasn't actually welcomed to go to the prayer meetings. Um, I was told that I could come to the Sunday services. The reason why was that from what I was told was that the prayer meetings were for specific called out group and whatnot. And, and I guess because I was not believing the same things, I wasn't following under their same protocol, um, it would not have been fit for me to be part of whatever it is that they were doing. Now, when it comes to this men's prayer group and the church that formed from it, these guys really preached holiness and righteousness and ceasing from sin and obeying Jesus. This is one thing I really valued about them. The problem with this group and why they're all of a sudden became an issue was idols. They were Christian idols. It was the views of the church system that caused the issue. It was confidence in the church system. Even the prophecies I mentioned earlier in this video circulate around church. If it wasn't a church school, it was some church work, not having a human pastor over you, uh, th these were the subjects at hand within these prophecies. Correction regarding sin and righteousness and judgment was going out the window and being um, put aside. And then the main focus was restoring the church. And the restoration came through the system that people idolized. 
it's a little bit strange because it caused division between people who actually believed in righteousness. Like we all believed in righteousness. We all believed in obeying Jesus. We all believed in ceasing from sin. But the argument came regarding how and the way. Are we going to submit to Jesus through man's system and our ideologies of how man should be operating? Or were we going to submit to Jesus by listening to and obeying Jesus directly? This was ultimately the issue that arose in this fellowship. Man's system being called the way that we are supposed to worship and follow Jesus. I have more to say regarding the subject, and I'm going to be covering that in a couple videos. I'm coming very close to the end of this major season of my life, and I'll be ending off with the testimony of how I came into perfection within that season, and I'll explain all of that when I get there. But the next video that I'm going to be doing is actually going to continue covering false prophets and Christians doing witchcraft and not even realizing it. The three of us, myself, my closest brother, and that other brother, once we started praying together, we started getting exposed to other fellowships again. And in my opinion, things got even more alive with some of the things that were going on in these fellowships.